Uh, Charles Capps has a book. Um, if you ever see it, go ahead and buy it and read it about authority in three worlds. And uh, that number three is um, kind of an important number. I love Bible numerology anyway. And so it deals with the Trinity, of course, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You and I, we're three-part beings. You may have shut the door. Them kids are going to be loud. And uh, that's okay, too. I'm, I'm glad they're here, even if they are loud. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we forget that we're three-part human beings. That has an important part to play in everything we do, too. We're, uh, I like that, you know, that I'm soul and spirit, and I'm going to live forever. I'm going to die no never. Anyway, you guys know that song, Jesus died on a tree for me. Now I'm going to live forever. So that our bodies are going to wear plumb out. And um, without going in great detail on this, uh, uh, we, uh, our battles are like in three different areas of our life. We have, this, we have the battles with self. That's what we're going to talk about the most, self battle, because you don't win the battle with self, you're not going to win the battle, the other two battles hardly, or probably. We have battles that we face, you know, they're just uh, deal with the world, simple things, you know, that can get under our skins, like leaving dirty dishes in the sink, you know. Uh, and sometimes those have spiritual roots behind those two. And the only reason that an issue would come up in that arena, I was offered that friendly uh, scenario today. Uh, and then there's the spiritual war that we've been really talking about. But if you fight it, it starts with self. If it's not fought in self, you never win the ones that we just are going to face in life. Plus, well, then we're not going to really be able to fight in the spirit world, spirit realm, period. Uh, when I say the world, uh, it's like, okay, say you're mowing the yard and your mower quits, you know, and you, uh, you, you get all with, uh, out of yourself because... You only had two hours to get it mowed. You ain't gonna, you know, now what am I gonna do? Who am I gonna get to work on it? And you get off of it and kick the tar, you know, and hurt your toe when you walk around, you know, you, you lost it. Well, it had nothing to do with the mower, it had everything to do with you, but we're always gonna have things around us in our world. Equipment wears out, you know, we've dealt with that issue here a lot of times. And everything, it all comes back though, to spiritual warfare, and it all comes back to dealing with self, okay? Making sure that, you know, it's me, that I'm okay. Now, anytime that you're dealing with someone else on any issue, whatever that it is, and especially when, if you were ever involved in deliverance of any kind, and a lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm never gonna be involved in that. Well, you know what? As a parent or a grandparent, you need to be prepared to be involved in it if not for any other reason, but it can be, could be your spouse, or it could be one of your children, could be a grandchild, could be a parent, could be somebody, because you want to know how to deal with wh whoever, whenever, whatever that it is. And so if you have a little bit of training, that's what we're trying to do is teach you a little bit. And uh, then you'll recognize, you look, you don't look, you know, uh, like the lawnmower, you don't think, well, you know, this mower's got a problem or you, uh, it did, it had a problem, or you wouldn't have kicked the tire. But the mower wasn't the problem. You know, that didn't help nothing. That just made matters worse. So it don't matter what kind of issues there are, you always go back to self, okay? How, why did I react this way? Why did they react that way? Uh, whoever it was. Say it's a, one of your children, and uh, they're doing something, and you automatically know that they did that because you used to do that or you're just like your father, okay? Or, you know, uh, boy, he makes me think of grandpa. You know, I, I compare my oldest brother to my grandpa a lot of times over the years because I inherited traits passed down. And so anytime that you're dealing with an issue in somebody else, there's a really good chance that you're gonna have some kind of issue too, okay? Just know that. And in the process of dealing with someone else's issues, you may have to deal with your own at the very same time. And it's really hard, you know, we have that uh, old saying, adage, uh, don't do, do as I say and not as I do, okay? So if you're trying to deal with somebody and they've seen you do that your whole life, they've heard you do that, they've watched you act that way, then you're gonna have to just engage. If, if you don't want them doing that, just say it was one of your own, 
because that's primarily who you're ever going to deal with anyway, is one of your own. And you don't want them to do that way, act that way, say those things. Then you got to look at self. You don't want them to do that because really you don't want to do it either. And if, and if you don't want them to do it bad enough to try to help them get out of that, then you need to want to do it bad enough to say, you know what, I'm just like that. We're going to deal with this together. Okay, we're going to look at this alike. And we're going to work at this, each one of us. And um, you can always, in, um, almost always expect some kind of manifestation anytime that you address anything that's not natural. Okay, so one of the things, you know, we got to figure out, we just can't accept that everything, that's who we are. That's the way I am. That's who I've always been. Okay, because it might not be natural to you at all. If, if it's not something that's good, something that's godly, then it's probably something that's bad, and that makes it worldly. And if it is, it needs to be dealt with on whatever level that needs to be dealt with. And uh, there's good in everybody. <clears throat> I, you know, sometimes you never see the good, but there's good in everybody. But there is also bad in everybody. And I, my oldest brother, he reads all the time. He's worse than Michelle. You know, Michelle's read all these books already this year. Kelly's read. I mean, and I, reading's good. I mean, it makes you smart. But then he's always telling me something. Every time I call him, it's an hour on the phone. He's telling you, I read this book. You're listening to this guy. You are today. And uh, one time he made a statement a year or two ago that it's, it stuck with me because I, I thought, you know what, uh, brother? You're right. You're, it, um, none of us know what we're actually capable of under certain circumstances, yeah. okay? None of us know. And because uh, we've seen, and you've done it too, all of us, we've done things and we thought, what, why did I do that? Yeah. I, you know, th was that me? Did I actually say that? Did I? Because within us, and I, I firmly believe that there's some deep-seated stuff in everybody, everybody, that may only ever come to light under certain circumstances when the devil has an opportunity to bring that to up, all right, stir that up, to use that. You know, there's, there's people, I, and I've, I've told this story a lot of times, but my brother David, just four years older than me, we got into a fight when Susan and I were still dating, so it's before I got married, before I, I was still 16 or 17. And uh, he blacked my eye, and I'd, if I'd had a gun, I'd have shot him, okay? If, if I had had a, I've only really been, mad twice in my life, once at him and once at Susan, okay? No, I never wanted to shoot you, but I, I would have shot him. I wanted to whoop her, okay? I did. I wanted to whoop her. I didn't, uh, but I wanted to. And uh, she did. She, she didn't need a whooping. She needed a spanking. I should have done that John Wayne thing and turned her over, you know, that Western movie. I like to watch that movie just for that reason. <laughs> Okay, it was McClintock, yeah. Um, and a lot of times it'd be over something as simple as that, you know, misunderstanding and all. But yeah, so, you know, I, I've never forgot that. But you, um, I mean, it, I went somewhere that I'd never been before. And I don't ever want to go back there. And, uh, I, you know, nobody, nobody would have thought. You know what people would have said? I can't believe you did that. How many times have we said that? I can't believe they done that. I can't believe because you've never seen anything out of those individuals that would have made you think they were possible or capable of those things. Well, just because we've never done that and people's never maybe said that about you and I, that doesn't mean that that capability is not there. And it's not because that capability is you, it's because that capability came with you through hereditary genes, okay? Or maybe some kind of trauma when you were a child that's been completely forgotten about in your subconscious. You know, when I was uh, two, when I was little, maybe I don't know what age now, uh, I have a scar here and another one down here because my mom had her coffee cup sitting on the side of the table and I was little enough, I reached up looking up at the top. So I was just old enough to walk. And so I have, I have, I have scars from burn. So I don't remember the pain. I don't remember it at all. I don't remember. But I guarantee you, I cried like a baby, <laughs> okay? I guarantee you that was sore for days, amen? As, and it scarred me physically for life. But I also know probably that somewhere there's a scar spiritually in there too. 
because I've never drank coffee. It tastes, uh, I tried, I took a sip of it one time and I'm like, this ain't for me, it smells bad. I don't even like, you know, um, if it's got any kind of coffee in it, whether that's subconscious or not, maybe that's just who I am, you know, but regardless, then again, it, it very well could be because, you know, there are, this is a complex, okay? Our, our whole system is complex. It's an unbelievable thing that God has done. There's no way in the world that anybody could ever contemplate the human body, how it's made, how it works together, all these extreme parts uh, operating the way they do and say there's not a God somewhere. You know, it takes an absolute idiot, and you can leave that on to believe that the Big Bang and this all happened uh, even over millions of years. It couldn't have never happened the way it did. And if it did happen that way, stuff would still be working for, and no, it's not. So just know that, all right? So I say that, but also let me say this too. We're, we don't know what we're capable of for God either, okay? Because we've never... We've never applied ourselves. We've never tested ourselves. We've never extended ourselves, got ourselves out of a box. We never explored some areas of our life because we get complacent. We have a, we get apathetic. Those are spirits too. You know, when we get to that place where we don't feel like, you know, we want to do anything, we just want to sit on a pew, sing our two songs, go home, stuff, you know, something's going on. And uh, we've never, ever, ever, and you, I don't guess you ever will, a minister to kids who doesn't really need their parents ministered to first because those kids are just a byproduct of their parents. So it's a good clue to all of us as parents or even grandparents to see what maybe our kids are doing and then be reminded, okay, that they got that from somewhere. Did they get that from me? Okay, and here's, here's the thing. When you as a parent or a grandparent can make correction in your life, you can pass that correction down too, all right? You, and once, you know, that we reach a, a level uh, where that God's taken care of us because we've trusted in Him and allowed that thing to be dealt with in our lives, then we're going to feel good about um, applying that to our children or grandchildren or someone else. So it always, it really needs to start at the top every time it can and work its way down. Now, when a, a young person is of age of them. Sales. Now, I firmly believe that uh, I didn't used to think this. We always, in the church, you know, we were taught age accountability. You know, like, you know, something happened to a kid that's a Hendrix scar that, you know, there's young enough. And, and, but I really believe it's about 13. I, I believe that's why the uh, bar mitzvah in the Jewish uh, realm and the bath, mar, bath mitzvah for the girls, you know, it's such a big deal because that's when they say that they've achieved a level of adulthood, even though they're not adults yet. Um, it's more my thought, and I think theirs too, that they've reached a, an age of accountability where they can now make uh, decisions for their own, you know, and be accountable for them. So um, if they're older than that, you know, probably they could have, you know, they could be ministered to in a little different way than you would someone that's under that age as well. But... I know this, you can, uh, you can always lay hands on and pray. I don't care if it's a six, if it's a one day old baby or, you know, uh, we prayed over um, um, Stella, you know, the same day she was born, you know, yeah, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Uh, but there comes a time in their life where it's not, where just laying hands on pray for them is not going to be, you know, not, that may not be enough. Okay. So you always want to be prepared best you can. Now, um, and the truth is, most homes have unresolved problems and issues within them, okay? Most homes, probably every home, has unresolved issues, whether it be with family members. Uh, most time it is family members when it's in the home. You know, sometimes in the church there's unresolved issues. And the truth is, you guys already know, when there's unresolved issues, generally the first thing that breaks down is communication. And if communication breaks down, then... You've done uh, shut off the power of the spoken word, you know, that does a lot of different things, including uh, deals with unresolved uh, problems and difficulties. You know, communication is key in everything. And if you can't communicate, you're not going anywhere productive. So you got to watch 
no communication, but you also got to watch what kind of communication that comes forth because most of us have stuck our foot in our mouths a few times and said things we shouldn't have said, made situations worse than what they are. But if there's unresolved issues uh, in a home or in a relationship, you know, um, we've dealt with married couples over the years who were struggling. In fact, I talked to one of our girls hadn't been here in several weeks now today, run on to her at Walmart, went over and squeezed her up, went to ask her what she was mad about. And of course she wasn't mad about anything. Uh, she just got lazy. You know, you miss once or twice. Next thing you know, you miss four or five. And then next thing you know, you haven't been there for three months. Well, she says to me and uh, my husband, we're, uh, we're maybe getting a divorce. I said, are you separated? She said, well, we sleep in different bedrooms right now, but we're in the same home. And, uh, and I said, well, yeah, thanks, you know, for not letting us know. So we couldn't pray, had no idea what was going on. You know, I, I was, I said, how can we help if we don't know what you're going through? Okay, it's just as simple as that. Well, uh, no doubt there's unresolved issues in that home. Okay, and those unresolved issues will stem from one or both of their past life, how the unresolved issues that both of them have. Okay, so you're not going to get a marriage restored and it, and it function correctly as long as there's lots of unresolved issues that keeps bringing that thing back up, like in their house. This ain't their first time, you know. I'd love for it to be their last time because they got three children who needs both parents, you know, and that's God's will for homes. And so if they were to come to us, we would have to deal with unresolved issues, okay? You, you would have to get them out. They, they've got to be on the table. And, and then they've got to want to deal with their unresolved issues. And then if you can get them to uh, open up honestly, you know, then you can begin to deal with the underlying issues that cause these to be unresolved. Why are you still like this? Why do you recognize this is wrong, but you still do it? Why? Okay, because see, we've already learned uh, this is what spiritual warfare, you're engaging in it on a scale that they don't realize you are because you're trying to find out the, you're trying to formulate a battle plan so you can deal with their underlying unresolved issues. You go to their root. Instead of, uh, over here at my house, we have a red bud. It's on the driver's, on the right-hand side of the driveway. And so I planted, I planted all the trees. Every tree out here we planted. And um, that, uh, the tree that was there, it died. It was a, it was a red bud, that's what it was. So it died, and then later on, there was a little sprout come up, and I thought it was a weed, and I'd cut it off. And then you go on, another one would come up, and I'd cut it off out of the ground. It'd come up out of the ground. Okay. And finally, I just let it grow, you know, and it, it got about so tall, and I just thought, well, I'm just going to trim it up. Well, you know what it is? It's a redbud tree, okay? And now it's about 8, 10 feet tall, and it looks good, okay? I never, I, it had an underlying issue, all right? It wanted to live. Well, inside every person, there's the underlying issue that they really do want to be better. They really do want to improve. They really don't want to go there. They don't want to be that person they were because it's, you know, God breathed into man. Man became a living soul. So there's inherent good. Everyone's capable of that inherent good. What, you got, what we have to do is expose the bad. And the more bad that you remove, the more good that you expose. Okay, so the, the more bad that comes out, the more all the good stuff begins to come out. It adds up and you're replacing. It ain't like you replace the bad with good because the good's already there. You're just, a, you're just not even, and here's what most people try to do. Uh, an unresolved issue, they will suppress. They will push it down. They'll try to maintain, control it on their own. And then, you know, it's, it's like a balloon. Devil come along and puff a little air in it it'll blow right back up, you know, that it was flat. Just like a balloon can be just flat as fit between two pages of this notebook. But you put a little bit of air in it and it'll flip all the pages over, okay? Well, uh, again, that inherent uh, capability to do bad is in us because those deflated balloons are in there, maybe from birth, childhood, uh, school issues when we was a kid, whatever that it may have been, okay? So you want to deal with the un resolved issues. Now, uh, we talked about gates, and I'm not going to teach on gates right now, but there's a lot of teaching in there, you know, about 
how, how do things enter? Well, some of them enter through hereditary factors. Some of them you were born with, okay? People that have anger issues, probably a parent had anger issues. Probably a grandparent had anger issues. People that have trouble with jealousy, they probably witnessed it from birth, probably a parent or, you know, just a lot of those things, but not always. Because sometimes we open our, our gates up, eye gates, ear gates, mouth gates, you know, because we live in this technological world now where we see and hear everything, you know, um, just like pornography. Uh, pornography is a big deal in our country. I'm talking, and you know what? It was a big deal 50 years ago. And it, there was a time when almost all pornography was in a magazine, okay? And about 75% of all pornography was sold to soldiers, okay? About 75% of it was sold to soldiers, Army, Navy, okay? Because they're on their own, no wife, no children, or no uh, girlfriends, you know? So, but nowadays, listen, it's, I don't even know if you can buy a magazine anymore. I, I don't even know. You know why? They don't need a magazine. Because the, the world, uh, everybody in the world has got a cell phone. And you can find anything and everything on a cell phone. And people say, well, why shouldn't I get my 12-year-old girl a cell phone? Why shouldn't I get my 13-year-old boy a cell phone? Well, you're exposing them to things that you never saw in your lifetime. Okay? And you thought it was bad, the things you were exposed to. You know what? That's an eye gate that opens a door. And it don't just crack it open. It swings it wide open. It and, and it does not close by itself. And the longer it's open, the more that comes in with it. And it leads to all sorts of tragedy, like just like divorce, all right, financial problems, lack of communication. He's always pushing the issue. And we're in the last days where he's had to speed up his, his attack. And uh, he's very good at it. And the best way he can do it is through media. You cannot, you cannot get people out of their phone, tablet, Laptop TV, okay? When uh, Susan and I were married and our kids were little, we went to church camp. And you know what our issue was then with kids? Was their jukebox, their boom box. It was music. Music is an ear gate, and it's a big ear gate. When I'm taking my 13-year-old granddaughter running around with me, you know what she's listening to from her phone? I call it crap, okay? That's what it is. And she don't see it that way. She don't hear it that way. She don't feel about it that way. She's 13. Uh, I, can't, I can't make her not. I couldn't make her not, but she, quit, she would quit running with me if she did. You know, it, it, you get on a territory where it's really tough. It's a spiritual issue. So I don't need to try to deal with it in, in a physical type of way. You know, I don't need to get angry with her, all right? I don't need to uh, physically you know, remove that or tear it up. And I can preach to her, and I do. I do preach to her about it. And sometimes I make her turn it off. And then sometimes I'll make her uh, tell me what they were saying because she was listening to one yesterday. And I, I heard the word weed. I heard, that's all I heard was the word weed. And I said, okay, sis, now you tell me, what was that song saying? She said, well, believe it or not, they were saying that it's not good for you. And I said, well, thank the Lord, you know, right? Uh, but still, that's, that's an ear gate. Uh, TV is an eye gate and an ear gate. It, you know, and same thing with phones, all the media. It's not just one gate, it's two gates. And any time a gate is open, something's going to come in. And when something comes in, something else will come with it. it may not storm in. It ain't like they go bad overnight. You know, because if it, if, I don't care who it was, if it felt really bad the first time, 99% of you would just stop it right then. Oh no, if it felt really bad and you oh no, I can't, I can't do that. I can't go there. You know, even teenagers, when you were a teenager, you know, I, I've, I had uh, buddies who were into uh, smoking weed when we were going to school. I had one of them crawl in my truck one night. We sat down at, used to be Bale's Free Queen. And uh, I could tell you his name when none of you know him. And I, I said, man, that's, that stinks. What is that? And he, uh, I don't remember what he called it, and I said, "You ain't smoking that in here. That stinks. Get out of here." And so I made him. I made him. He didn't get mad at me. He, you know, we were friends, even though. But you know what? If I just said, "Hey, let me have a hit off of that. You got any more of that?" Okay. I mean, I was just smart enough at 16 to know I didn't want to go there. All right. So I never went there. Um, and I, you know, thank God I didn't. 
I wasn't quite as smart with alcohol, and that stuff tasted so bad, I don't know anybody drinks it. You know, I never had a taste of alcohol that tasted good ever in my life. Some people like the taste of it, and I'm like, if you like the taste of alcohol, it's because you were, it was inbred in you to like it. Because it has no good flavor to it at all. And if you, and my parents never drank. And my grandparents didn't drink. So my, on either side, they were not. That was not who they were. Okay? Now, you know what? There's another side to that story. Because my wife's parent, our dad drank. He was an alcoholic. And if either of my children were in here right now, Davis or Kelly, they tell you that alcohol did not taste bad to them. They liked the, they liked the taste of it. They didn't get it from me. They didn't get it from Susan. She don't like the taste of it either. It can skip a generation. That's why you don't just look at a parent. You've got to go further back. But the, the iniquity, it can, be, it can be that balloon that's flat. If that balloon never gets an opportunity to receive air, it'll stay flat. In fact, you give it enough years of time, that thing will just rot away and will never be an issue. But if, if you give it, you give the devil an inch, he'll take them all. You give him a crack, he'll just keep pushing on the door, try to get it wider. So just know that. So anytime that we recognize that there's, you know, when we, when we say we deal with an issue, one of the things that we're saying is we're closing the door. Okay? I'm going to close the door on this. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? I'm shutting the gate. If you've got cattle in a pen and you leave the gate open, they'll get out if they want to. So if you think, okay, I don't want no cattle to get out anymore, I'm shutting the gate. Shut the gate. You lock the gate. You can't, you're not going to get out through the gate. You're going to have to go over the fence, you know, or something. But not only do you keep what's in in, you keep what's out out. Right, And one of the most important things that we've got to do in our society today is not just keep what's in in, because a lot of times what's in needs to be removed. But we've also got to keep what's out not from getting in. We've got to make sure that we're protecting our own and that we're trying our best to clean up and, re and resolve the issues that we have within ourselves and then in our world. Because I think I've talked about this. I know I did Sunday. Our, our biggest battle is, is self. All right, our biggest battle is self. We sure don't need to go around trying to fix everybody else. You know, um, Jesus, he dealt with that a little bit. He said, why well, try to get the, um, the splinter out of somebody's eye when you've got a beam in your own? All right, when you're worse than what they are, well, see, that's someone that lives, who's got a lot of issues, self-denial and pride and no telling what all, for them to be looking. And we grew up in churches that were like that. I'll be honest with you. We grew up in churches where, you know, the preacher would be preaching and, and they'd be thinking, well, oh, he's talking about old Bill over there today or he's talking about whoever, you know, because they never wanted to admit they had any problems of their own because they, they done mask their own, never dealt with their own issues and didn't think anybody knew they had any because they had a mask. Truth is, everybody had them, needed to, be, to have been dealt with. And if they'd learned, if they'd had any kind of teaching, that's why I called it a forbidden subject, in the church during our lifetime because it was never taught on. Uh, and if and if the preachers, you know, they hired preachers, it was all out of order because uh, they'd hire a preacher that they could fire, all right? It had nothing to do with God calling them, sending them there, telling them to be there. It was hire and fire. They were always concerned. They didn't have a home. They had a wife, they had kids, had responsibilities. They were worried about where their next meal was gonna come from, paying their insurance. And so they were like, well, I can't, I can't alienate these guys. They'll bring me on, the, they'll call me on the carpet. All right. And you know what? Uh, it was, it's sad. All right. It's really sad what they did to the pastors. And we watched it. We were friends. We were good to pastors. Was, and when I preached her dad's funeral after he got saved, let me tell you, he was what they called a pastor's friend. They all came to his funeral because when everybody else was putting them down and running them off, Brother Gene was still supporting them and encouraging them and, and helping them, praying for them. All right, he, he helped them. Uh, I guarantee it, babysat their kids. We done all, they, we all did, we did too later on. And, uh, but it's, it never was that way, all right? Because it wasn't God's way, it never was. And uh, if it had been God's way, then they, they couldn't have been hiring and firing and pastors would have been at liberty to preach truth 
and without truth, what happens? What is it in John 8, 32? You shall know the truth, and the truth makes you free. So if there's no truth that's preached or taught, then there's no freedom. What did they have to have freedom from? The unresolved issues that were in their lives. Okay? And there wasn't. So they, they couldn't stick to the New Testament Bible teaching letters to the epistles in the early church because Paul and Peter dealt always with unresolved issues in people. So they stuck to Bible stories and the Gospels where Jesus went about doing good, you know, and, and healed people. And those, that's all good gospel. That's all good preaching. It's good teaching. Okay? It's good preaching, but it's not good teaching. Let me, get, let me straighten that out. It's good preaching, but it's not good teaching. And uh, I used to really preach hard when I first started years ago. And you know what uh, God told me? He, he, said, um, he said, my people don't need to preach that. They know, this. They know sin is sin. He said, they need taught. They need taught. People need taught. They need taught how to live. They need taught how to fight. And we needed taught. So we, we, had, we were learning then. We've learned a lot since because we studied. And you learn more when you teach than you do any other time. Listen, if, you know, if I come in Sunday and the Lord gives me a sermon that's a preaching sermon. It's because there's people in here who need preached at. And so sometimes it gets a little preachy, but there's also teaching in it. You, you've learned that. You guys have been around long enough. And you can do both. And people need both. Sometimes you need preached at. And, but you can't do that all the time. You, uh, you just can't do it. If you preach at somebody all the time, they take it personally. They become offended. They quit coming to the trough to eat. And if they don't come to the trough and eat, they starve to death. And they die. And they die with unresolved issues, eating them up. Okay? You know, one of the reasons why that uh, if you raise livestock, that you would always try to feed them in an, in an area where you could see them, okay? Because you, while you were feeding them, you would look for unresolved issues in your herd, whether it was cattle or whether it was swine or even your chickens, pretty much every time. You make sure that they're all there, okay? It's the same way in the church. That's one of the, just another a chapter in a book, 150 Reasons Why a Church is Good for You, that way you're in a collective being fed where you can unresolved issues can be found out because most people don't volunteer them. They don't volunteer them. You've got to have discernment. You've got to be able to see. You've got to make an invitation, have an altar available. You know, um, Sunday, Sunday, somebody come to the altar, be prayed for. All right, you know why they came? Because they had an unresolved issue that needed to be prayed over. And they... they they came unashamed. Um, amen? You understand what we're saying? Okay. Now, let's get right on this one and this word we'll get to tonight, and we, whether we get past it or not. The, the thing, we've already talked about this some today too probably. We always got to recognize the need for two things, repentance and forgiveness. You hear me? Repentance and forgiveness. We've all sinned, come short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes. We either have sins of omission or sins of commission. And if you haven't learned this yet, you do some of both. But most time Christians do as many of the omission type as we do the commission type. Because you don't sit out on a Monday, you know, thinking, well, I may lie a little today and I may cheat a little tomorrow. No, you sit out thinking, I'm not, I'm going to watch myself. I don't, you don't plan on lying, do you? How many of you have a hard time lying now? Let's be honest for a minute. How, you have a hard time lying? You know, you fall in a place where that, a lie would be better than the truth, and you have a hard time lying because you know that you're not supposed to lie, and so you, you roll that around in your head, thinking, how can I answer this question? What can I do without being in trouble, without lying? You didn't used to do that, did you? Nope. Because now you've learned that that's something that's not right. And, uh, you know, I, I had to tell my boss a long time ago, I, I just told my Jared, he was, he was the boss I told it to. I said, Jared, I'm not lying for you. Just, I just want you to know I'm not lying for you. Okay, so don't, don't even ask me to because I'm not going to do it. And so I don't think he ever asked me to, but everybody else lied for him a lot. But they didn't have the same conviction that I had. Okay, so I had the conviction 
that if I lied, all right, and I felt bad about it, I knew I'd have to repent. Right. Now, I advise every Christian to repent every day. All right? You may not even know. You may lay down tonight, and I hope that you do. I hope you all lay down at night before you fall asleep. If you're like me, you better do it quick because I'm going to be asleep pretty quick. And you may, you may be able to say, uh, Father, I don't think I did anything wrong today. I don't, I don't think I hurt anyone. I don't think I said anything wrong. I don't, okay, I don't feel bad about having done something. But Lord, if I have, if I, I repent. If I didn't live my life the, today the way you wanted me to live it, if I didn't do something that you wanted, if I ignored you, you know, just cover your tracks every day. We have to have repentance. We have to keep ourselves in the clear with God all the time because we can't deal with other things, whatever they are, if I'm not in the clear. If, if I'm not at peace and I don't feel good about my relationship, if I, if I think I need to pray, but I, you know, I, don't, I think, well, God's probably mad at me or, you know, I haven't done anything beneficial. The devil will tell you, you know, that God's ignoring you. Uh, he's mad at you. The devil will give you all kinds of lies. How many times in your life have you felt worthy to actually pray? Now, think about that just for a minute. How many times in your life have you actually just felt worthy? You know, it's like, well, you know, God, we know God loves us, all right? And we know that everything we get from God's undeserved because we've not really, we've never done anything enough to deserve the good life. We live good lives, okay? You know, your life, you may have had rough times, uh, listen, you ain't got to look very far to find somebody that's had it way worse than what you've ever had it. Uh, you know, we live in America, and that alone, uh, why do we have hundreds of thousands of people that want to come here? All right, because they, they've seen how we live even at our worst. You know, there's some of those, and I'm, I'm against 100,000 of them coming, okay? I don't have anything against them, all right, because, you know, there are people there that, a very good people crossing that border. They're very bad people crossing too. And they're putting up a, a, a big, they ain't coming in right. This is the land of opportunity for those who will immigrate correctly, come in, all right, good people. But there's, that's not what this is about. Just know that. It's easy for us to get into an arena where that uh, we look down our nose maybe. That's why we have to repent. You know, we can have a bad thought about Biden easy, amen? You know, we have to watch our mouth and watch what we say, how we say it. Uh, there is, uh, I had a, I saw a reel where somebody questioned a, a Christian, a minister, I can't remember which one it was the other day, and they said, do you think that God put Biden in the office? Well, he answered biblically. He said, uh, Paul told the church at Rome that there's nobody that has power but what God didn't give it to them. So yes, God allowed Biden to be elected. Uh, he allowed the Democrats to steal the election. Now, what the reason behind that? Okay, it's, it's an obstacle for the whole country. We've been, we're preaching on obstacles. How do we overcome obstacles? Spiritual warfare. We've had a church that one praying, believing, standing ground, defending our country, being united, not doing Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. You know, in general, and uh, all you gotta do is read the Old Testament, and you know that God, He allows what God's people, He allows what His people allows. So we as Americans allowed that to happen. God gave them, God allowed it. That's why it happened. That's the truth. That doesn't give us a right to curse them. What are we supposed to do to our enemies? Love our enemies. So see, there's always, I just share that because there's always reason for us to repent, always. And one of the things, one of the areas, without repentance, then, you know, un, that's the first unresolved issue. Okay, that's number one. So we deal with that. So now I don't, I'm clean. I'm clear with God. I can boldly approach the throne of grace, find mercy, all right, in my help, in time of need. I, I got that resolved. And then the next one is forgiveness. And where's our number one issue? It's self. And sometimes it's easier to forgive everybody but ourselves. And sometimes we think uh, that we've got it done and we haven't. Okay? Sometimes... All right, we have a bad thought and we think, where'd that come from? It came out a little bit of unforgiveness. And actually, you know, I think uh, maybe um, unforgiveness is like a, let's say it's 100% and I knocked 1% off, I'm still at 99. I've knocked 50% off, I still got 50% of unforgiveness 
You may not even know it, okay? Because un unforgiveness can be a balloon. It can be an unresolved issue from your past, from your childhood, uh, from your teenage years, from a early adulthood, and you put it aside, you put it out of your mind, you thought, okay, I'm done with that, that's over with, and we went through the motion, we probably even said the right words. If you're around here, you said the right words, okay? Because Susan will harp on because it's important. Because it's an unresolved issue that stops, it, it's life and death. It stops uh, communication between you and God in regards to dealing with anybody else's unresolved issues because you have one that's front and foremost. So we always have to search your heart. That's why, I'm, uh, just like repentance, I say just do it every day, you know? And especially if you do something, do it right then. You know, if you know that you've done something, just go ahead and do it that moment. And if you don't know, just go ahead and repent for whatever may or may not have been done. Um, that way you don't have any unresolved issue with that. Now, unforgiveness, okay? So, again, when you're repenting, you can go ahead and repent for unforgiveness because what is it Susan tells you, teaches you? Um, God forgive me, Right? For not forgiving myself, not forgiving myself, because a lot of times, listen, when we've had a history of things in our life, some of them are hidden. Sometimes those unresolved issues are hidden, and if, if you're working on them, God knows you're working on them, He will expose them as you go, and you're not being accountable for something you don't remember as yet. But when you need, when that comes, then you recognize it, and you'll think, oh, oh. See, I, I, sometimes I have stopped and think, I, and I do this, you, I'm sure some of you may too. If you don't, you will. You know, I'll look at the incident between me and my brother David. Okay, do I, you know, I, I search myself. Do I, do I have that clear? Am I clear from that? Okay. You know what? Is there 1% a, a, of that left in me? Sometimes we have to dig deep. Sometimes we don't even know. We think, okay, you know, that was, gosh, that was 50 years ago. Surely I've got that under, that's water under a bridge flushed out into the Mississippi River down in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, and the bottle floated up over there in China somewhere. That, you know, that's what, but, but is it? Okay, but is it? You know, uh, I'm, and, and everybody I know, almost everybody I know, had some hurt issues from their past. Hurt issues. Hurt issues are some the hardest to get past. Hurt issues. You know, um, I got into it with guys at school. I, I threatened to whoop a boy in the locker room one day and uh, picked them up and thrown them up against the locker and asked him if he wanted some of it. You know, he made me uh, ticked off a little bit. And I wasn't that much bigger than him. And I picked on the little ones on occasion for fun. But, you know, I was upset at the time. But... You know, that just blowed right over. So I, I've never felt any regret, any lasting anything. I'm, right now I'm trying to remember his name because I don't remember the boy's name at the time. You know, so I know, I'm like, no, there's, that's, all, that's okay. You know, I hope that uh, he feels like I do, that that was just a couple of teenage boys, you know, had a little, had words, you know, and is over with. But uh, also, one of the things that come up from my past that I had to deal with personally was when I was about nine, 10 years old, my grandma and aunt were going to, supposed to come by my house, pick me up Christmas, and I was going to go Christmas shopping for my mother. I didn't care about anybody else in my family, but I, I loved my mom and I had money in my pocket. So this, this young boy sat at the window waiting for him, and they forgot me. Okay? They forgot. It was a hurt issue, all right? Now I still had the memory of that, but don't have the hurt. Think about that. I have the memory, but I don't have the hurt. So you know when the forgiveness is complete, when you can, you can still have the memory, but you don't have the hurt. So that's how God will deal with you. When you feel some hurt, okay, then know that you personally have an unresolved issue that needs to be dealt with through forgiveness, forgiving yourself. Now you may have to forgive them before you can forgive yourself, so that brings us right back to something we've already learned. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. They didn't deliberately leave me at home. They didn't deliberately forget me, okay? Uh, it wasn't nothing deliberate. 
They may, it, it may slip their mind. I'm an, I'm an adult now. I know that sometimes things slip your mind, you know, but I, I still had to forgive them to deal with my own forgiveness there with the hurt, right? Of course, life went on. I loved them and treated them good. And, um, and most of the time when it's, when it's yourself, it has nothing to do with somebody else. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It wasn't them that done it anyway. It's something that you got caught up in. It's something how you felt about yourself. It's some. That's right. Now, hopefully, you know, the way it normally works and should work is the closer you get to God, the less you ever blame God. Okay? You know, but right now, anytime you deal with a tra- a trauma, tragedy in people's lives, I'm telling you, that's the first thing the devil does is, you know, well, you've, you, you've all heard it. Well, God loved you, he wouldn't send you to hell. Well, God don't send you to hell, you know, but they're believing a lie. You send yourself to hell. We have an option. Heaven and hell is an option. That's right. It's your choice. Uh, God didn't create hell for people. He created it for the devil and the angels. And he has to make room there for people who have made wrong choices. I'm, but now most people in our world don't know that, right? They don't understand earthquakes and tornadoes and um, all these things that God allows. They say, well, God did that. Well, you know what? Sometimes God does do that because God uses what's in our world, okay, to bring about what his perfect plan is, right? Because judgment's coming. And if, if you mess up long enough, God will, you'll be judged by it, okay? But again, literally, I don't, you know what? A tornado could come and come right straight across through here, take out about six houses over there, and it could skip Brian and, and Barb's, it could skip the church, it could skip my house and go right over there, and take out JR and just keep on going, all right? And everybody be wondering why, okay? Well, you know why? Because we speak through the wind and the rain, right? Because we understand some things that nobody else would understand. And they'd be saying, and some of them would be saying, well, uh, you know what they'd say? Boy, Brother Down Susan must be living right. You know, <laughs> you know, what, you know what that is? That's the truth. That would be the truth. They would say it whether they believed it or not because it would be apparent that we found some favor, they, whether they accredited it to God or not, okay? They would still accredit that to us as finding that favor, okay? Now, if that tornado comes and it takes out Brian and Barb's house and the church, you know what? I wouldn't say, God, what would you do that for? I wouldn't say that. You know why? Because I've learned God. I, I, would, I would be looking for a reason, okay? But I would, all the time I'm looking for a reason, I'd be thinking, God's got something in store. God's got a plan. Because God works all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. And so when something happens that way, you know, I used to get so excited, Susan and I, we're like everybody else for years, and we're still that way to a large degree, is we, we live primarily from paycheck to paycheck, you know, and we did okay. But if something big come along, you know, it would be like we would fret over it. And maybe there would be times when um, I would have a check coming, you know, like, and it would be enough to pay our taxes. Or it would be enough. It was, when Davis was born, we, we had a hospital bill at Kennett. Yeah, Davis. Uh, for a while, and I was paying on it, but I wasn't paying what they wanted me to pay. And so I get this letter, and I got up here at court and uh, before a judge because they're going to set a new payment schedule on that debt. And so you know what happened? The same day I got the letter in the mail, I got, the, I got my tax refund for the year, and my tax refund was enough to pay it, and I didn't have to go to court or nothing. It was like I was smart enough to know, thank you, God, because if I'd got that a week before, we'd have spent it. If I'd got it the day before, yeah. I wouldn't have enough money to pay that bill. Yeah. But I got it when I needed it. Yeah. Well, God, God didn't just do that once in our life. God did that a lot of different times. So after he'd done that for us just a few times, you know, whether it's two or three or four, it'd be like, I just, I would have to calm myself down. I'd have to say, you know what, God, I, you, you know what's happening, Lord. You know, you know what's ahead. So I'm not going to worry about it. I'd have to bind that up in me. Because it's just human nature for us to be concerned about putting new tires on our car, you know, whatever that it may be. So just like Tiffany with Marcus right now, Tiffany, we're going to be praying with you, right? Because, yeah, this is a scary thing. And Tammy Manis and Mike, 
listen, uh, they're breadwinners. They got bills to pay. They got children. They got home, you know. But uh, they got two options, right? They can let, you can let it become an unresolved issue. Okay, you can, but you don't have to. And you won't because you've already been there and you know that God's going to take care of you one way or another. A lot of people in our world don't know. Thank God that Tiffany's been here enough over the years. She's learned some things and, uh, and she's good and she's smart and God loves her and God's going to take care of her and we're going to pray, all right, divine favor. And, w- and when we do that in agreement, we're, we're actually fighting. This is where you become your brother's keeper. This is how we fight one another's battles. This is how we were actually engaging in spiritual warfare and helping to keep her guarded so that fiery darts don't become unresolved issues. Because she could, the devil wants her to get into that self-pity mode and say, why God, why is that closing? What are we going to do? Wring her hands, you know, that's not going to happen in Jesus' name. But look how many people it will. Wonder how, what the percentage of people whose jobs are go- or lifestyles are going to be affected by the closing of that plant, just like the one at Dexter closed, all the rest of them. So you deal with them as they come. But if I have unforgiveness, then I'm in a place where I'm consumed by my own unresolved issue or it hinders me from talking to God about other people's problems, sharing in their problems, okay? Now, I got a simple prayer that I'm going to share with you. And... Uh, because you don't have to make these things diff- difficult, okay? Don't make something difficult. God knows your heart. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows where you've been, what, what got you to where you are. He knows where you're headed. Lord Jesus, I am sorry for all the bad things I have done. Please forgive me. You don't have to list them, okay? You're putting them, because you couldn't list all the bad things you ever did anyway. God knows all the bad things that may be on your record. You're, ask, you're actually asking for a clean slate. For all the bad things I've done, please forgive me. Right? Please forgive me. I love you. I belong to you. I want to live for you. I forgive everyone who's ever hurt me. Now, if you feel hurt later on and a person's image, mine, name comes up, then you can voice that made me mad, including myself. Made me mad, including myself. Because sometimes we work ourselves up into a frenzy. Have we not? We've let something get under our skin and it just crawled around. And yeah, we have. Okay, in Jesus' name. See, that's not difficult. Not difficult. One not you say it absolutely every day. Keep a clean slate always. And you can do that. That's not just for yourself. You can do that with people. Listen, you, all right? It's one of them things that if, if you had a really good memorization skill, you can memorize it. And, but you basically can because it's, it's, it's just a simple prayer that covers the basics. And God knows your heart. Okay? God knows your heart. Amen? <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads. So, Father, tonight I thank you, Lord, that, God, we can have very simple, very understandable teaching from your word. I thank you, Lord, for your spirit that leads us, Father, down a path of righteousness for your name's sake. That, Lord, we can engage in spiritual warfare because we're fully protected by your armor, and we know the word, and we have the word, and we apply the word against our enemy. Lord, help us always to remember, to repent, and to forgive. Father, so that we're useful to the kingdom and to the building of the kingdom. Thank you, Father, for reminding us that we too, Lord, can have things working within us that would hinder us from being everything that we're supposed to be. We thank you for your forgiveness, Lord, who forgave us all, who has cleansed us, washed us clean, made a place for us in heaven. Father, whose your grace and your mercy that endure forever are our covering. And Lord, you are our strength when we're weak. And when we think that we can't do something, remind us, Lord, that we can do all things through you because it's you who strengthens us. Thank you, Lord, for our time together tonight. Bless each one as we travel home. Lord, in the fog, bless Christy, who's driving the furthest. Lord, just give her safe passage home tonight. 
Allow angels minister to her every need. Lord, for everyone, Mike and Angela, driving seven and a half mile, Lord, bless them. Even Barb and Lord Susan and I, we live so close, we can walk home in the dark. Father, bless God. Thank you, Lord, for Debbie. Thank you, Lord, for Tiffany. Bless her and the kids on their way, Lord, back home. God, I pray, Lord, that the seed that we plant, Lord, grows, Father, inside our hearts and produces your perfect will in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.